Hey everyone, let's make them line a second time. Ask for their W-9, and then on the form 4506-A, which is the request for public inspection or copy of exempt or political organization IRS forms, let's find out what the IRS has to say about them. And we're going to shine the light of truth on unjust incarcerations and misdeeds of mortgage lenders. All these we're going to try to do via the CVB, which is the Central Violation Bureau, which um, is an entity that I spoke about in some videos. So if you went back to case dismissed administratively, uh, these are on Rob Ryder YouTube site, sorted by upload date, case dismissed administratively, and option B, Central Violation Bureau would, you know, explain what this is I'm talking about, the CVB. And today is Sunday, December 11, 2016. I am Rob Ryder. My email address is courtofrecord at aol.com. That's C-O-U-R-T-O-F-R-E-C-O-R-D at aol.com. Phone number is 616-712-6179. And donate if you can, please. Uh, my PayPal account is my daughter's email address. That is the name of the PayPal account, and that's Ashley Ritluski at gmail.com. A-S-H-L-E-Y-R-Y-T-L-E-W-S-K-I at gmail.com. Credit card, if you had one and wanted to use it, and you e emailed me at quarterrecord at AOL.com, I think that uh, there's a way we could make that work. And snail mail, well, that's just send it in the mail to Robert Ritluski to 10955 14 Mile Road, Northeast, Rockford, Michigan, 49341. And uh, so, how, how and why would we want to do these things? Well, let's first of all go look at one. Back in early 2015, I had asked, uh, I had emailed Kent County to the Kent County Commissioner's um, Executive Assistant asking for a copy of the W-9 for Kent County. And she sent me this, which is a W-9 for the County of Kent. Um, says they're the government and gave their address. And it gave an uh, EIN number. And it was signed by somebody named Brooke Smith on 2-27-15. That was the day that I asked for it. Um, or thereabouts. So one thing about this form is the form they sent me is from 2007. And if you were to look, well, we have ones that are newer than that. And so I don't know why they're using the 2007 and 2015, but they did. And um, and so, you know, my question has always been, well, then what's the name of the county? Is it K Kent County, the way that it shows online and they show in a lot of their brochures and stuff, or is it the county of Kent, which is the way they use it on lots of forms? And I say they're substituting one for the other, and they're simulating being the county when they say they're County of Kent. And uh, so that was kind of what the make them wine asked for a W-9 was before. But this wouldn't just be for the County of Kent. This would be, or Kent County for that matter, this would be for any entity that claims to be exempt for any reason for taxes. So if you had that form, and the main reason for me to get to do the form was to get the name, because they're supposed to put their proper name here. It's supposed to be their full legal name. And to get the EIN number that they say goes to that full legal name. All right. And um, so then I had found this form. as soon as it uh, loads. Hang on just a second. And uh, 
I had been looking around in the, uh, I call it the IRS Manual 6209, 6209. If you were to Google IRS Manual 6209, you would find a manual. Although that's not really its name, but it'll take you to it. It's put out every year, list all sorts of things, a bunch of coding information for computer codes. But the one thing it has in Section 2 is it lists all the forms that are used by the IRS and the tax class that goes to them. And so I was going through those forms one day and I found this one. It's called the Form 4506-A, Request for Public Inspection or Copy of Exempt or Political Organization IRS Form. I said, That's interesting. And so I looked at it and I said, well, you put the exempt organization and you put the requester and you pick a category for the requester and... Uh, you go down and you pick from the various choices what it is that you would want to have and well you're done. You don't have to sign it. You don't do anything with it. You can fax it. As it turns out. So for me it was real simple. I got a W9. It says it's the County of Kent and it says this is their EIN number and this is their address and uh, good enough. So then it came to the requester and it wanted a name. And so I was going to put my full legal name, which is my name like it is over here under contact person, proper case, Robert Allen Ritluski, but then I read three and it, well actually four, said all requesters except commercial users must provide an explanation how the records will be used. And I could have thought of something, maybe and did it, and I said, well, I don't want to do that. I'll just do it this way. I'll say my all caps is the commercial entity, because it is and use the address that's on the driver's license that goes to the, or the operator's permit actually, that goes to the name. And so I put all that down and I just filed city or town, state or province, country, zip, or foreign postal code. Well, that'd be Rockford, Michigan, United States with the zip 49341. Uh, my phone and uh, the date that I did it, which was November 15th. But again, I put my proper name as being the contact person and my all caps as being the requester. Check box three, being a commercial user. So I didn't have to answer four. And I just went down to the only one that I cared about at the moment, which was the determination letter. Because anybody who wants to be, uh, have, uh, be considered tax exempt can't just say they are. They have to have the IRS acknowledge that they are. And that's the determination letter from the IRS that acknowledges that somebody is who they say they are. Um, so here's an example. Example organization, private letter rulings, and determination letters. The Office of Associate Chief Counsel will rule on the tax consequences of proposed changes to organizations, purposes, or activities. Thus, if you are unsure about whether proposed changes are consistent with your status as an exempt organization, you may want to request a private letter ruling. The exempt organization uh, determination office issues determination letters on matters listed in section 704 of uh, Revenue Procedure 2016-4, including requests for recognition of tax exemption. So until they say that you are exempt, you're not exempt. Doesn't matter, you filled out the forms. And so, I want to see their determination letter. Now they have a similar thing for uh, uh, do 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 do. That wasn't it. All right, hang on a second. And so they also have another one. If you were to Google governmental information letter, you could go to the IRS site and see this. It's just easier for me to have it uh, on paper like this. So government entities are frequently asked to provide tax-exempt number or determination letter to prove its status as tax-exempt, to prove its status as tax-exempt, to prove its status as tax-exempt, or charitable, charitable entity. For example, applications for grants for private foundation or charitable organization generally require this information as part of the application process. In addition, donors frequently ask for this information and substantiation that the donor's contribution is tax deductible and vendors ask for this, substanti this to substantiate that the organization is exempt from sales and excise tax. 
The Internal Revenue Service does not provide tax-exempt number. A government entity may use its Federal 10, also referred to as an EIN, for identification purposes. Governmental units such as states and their political subdivisions are not generally required to are not generally subject to federal income tax. Political subdivisions of states are entities with one or more of the sovereign powers of state, such as the power to tax. Typically they include counties and municipalities and their agencies or departments. Charitable contributions to governmental units are tax deductible under 170 C1 for of the Internal Revenue Code if made for public purposes. And so you can donate to the government, but that's the only th that makes it exempt to you. Right? They're tax deductible. Um, but they still have to know it's a political subdivision. Entities that an entity that is not a political subdivision but that performs an essential governmental function may not be subject to federal income tax pursuant to code 115. The income of such entities is included for the definition of gross income as long as the income is derived from the public unit uh, utility or exercise of essential government function and it accrues to a state a political subdivision of a state or the District of Columbia contributions made to entities whose income excluded income under section 115 may be tax deductible to contributors. In order for the government entity to receive a determination of its status as a political subdivision, instrumentality of the government, or whether its revenue is exempt under Internal Revenue Code section 115, it must obtain a letter ruling by following the procedure specified in Revenue Procedure 2012-1 or its successors. There is a fee associated with this obtaining a letter ruling. Uh, but as a special service to government entities, the IRS will issue a government information letter free of charge. This letter describes government entity exemption from federal income tax and cites applicable Internal Revenue Code sections pertaining to deductible contributions and income tax exclusions. Most organizations and individuals will accept the governmental information letter as the substantiation they need. Although it's not specific to the entity that you're speaking of, it's just a form letter. And we're going to look at it here a little bit. The wording and the form of the letter is a lot of what we've just read. The important thing to understand is that to be called a political subdivision, you need to have a ruling. And why that is important is, is that... Um, Political subdivisions of a state are entities with one or more of the sovereign powers of state, such as the power to tax. So, if they can, there's three sovereign powers of state: the power to tax, the power to police, and the power of eminent domain. To have any of those three powers, the IRS has to agree you're who you say you are. If they don't, you can't tax, you can't police, and you cannot condemn property. And that's the things they're doing. So, uh, da, 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 da. where is that? No, that wasn't it. IRS instructions. Here it is. Here's the form letter. So here's an example of this form letter that the State University of Iowa payroll office asked for using Federal identification number 42-600-4813. Dear taxpayer, this responds to your request for information about your federal tax status. Our records do not specify your federal tax status. In other words, the IRS has no record that these people are who they say they are. However, the following general information about tax treatment of state or local governments and affiliated organizations may be of interest to you. Right? But it doesn't mean it applies because you don't have a letter. Governmental units such as states and their political subdivisions are not generally subject to federal income tax. Blah, 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 blah. The stuff we already read. All right? Our records do not specify your federal tax status. In other words, they haven't seen the paperwork yet. So that's why, you know, it's kind of important to know, right? Hey, do they have their, their determination letter? Um, and so, 
I had uh, da, 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 da. Well, let's close some of these up. Don't need that one. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Hey, if you can, write that down. Don't need that for now. Uh, here we go. So, um, I filled this form out on uh, November 15th and I got an answer from the Internal Revenue Service dated December 1st 2016. That's the first time in memory that the IRS has ever contacted me using all my names although they're in all caps right your taxpayer is your middle initial name so normally if the IRS is contacting me it would say Robert A. Rutluski this says Robert Allen Rutluski in all caps because that was the entity that contacted them. So as far as I'm concerned they disagreed with me that that is a commercial entity because they gave me an answer. Dear Sir or Madam, again I didn't have to sign it or say who I was. I did have to give them a contact information but I didn't have to sign the form. So here we go. This is a response to your request dated November 15, 2016. Request for information about the tax exempt status of the County of Kent. We, that would be the IRS, we have no record of this organization having tax exempt status under Internal Revenue Code Section 501A. Therefore, we're unable to provide any documents in response to your request. <laughs> they don't exist. You can find more information about tax exempt entities and so forth in publication 557. You can visit their website or you can call and ask more questions and that's probably what I'll do. They give me a person to contact, be Mr. Malloy, toll free. So hey, if you want to do this yourself, just write them down right now. That's a person to contact and go get your county EIN number and let's just call them and see if he can tell us anything right? without even doing the form. But, you know, I mean, that wasn't that hard to do the form. It was, uh, and this is uh, called the Form 4506-A. And all you need to do is put the name of the entity, their EIN number, their address, your all caps, your proper case name, the address on your driver's license, or, you know, I don't care what you use. I mean, I'm not going to get into that. That's, that's up to you all. Tell them you're a commercial user. You don't have to give them a reason for the request then. And uh, come down here and check in box 9, determination letter. That's how I did it. You may decide to do it different, but, you know, there's one way to do it. And within two weeks, I got an answer. <sighs> and uh, so there we are. Now, now, having got this answer, it's like, now what am I going to do with this? Because I've already complained to the IRS before about these people not being who they say they are. To the Treasury. Got all sorts of people. Um, so, uh, I'm going to write it up as a complaint and send it to the uh, Central Violation Bureau, the CVB, similar to what I had spoken about to do um, for other complaints which I spoke about in my last video. Videos, right? Central Violation Bureau. Uh, case dismissed administratively. So in this one I was talking about how in two cases where I had written letters to the chief judge, the cases got dismissed. Now they didn't dismiss them. It doesn't say it was because of the letters I wrote. I'm just saying, hey, the cases got dismissed. Like they tried to find a reason to make them go away. In one case, they told the person that they were not not guilty. Case closed. <laughs> not not guilty means you're guilty. Case closed. You're out of here. Didn't matter. You're out the door. We're done. Uh, Central Violation Bureau. Now, this is the place that, according to an Army regulation I was reading, when I was looking at a sworn statement form as being the the document to use, right? So if you just... Uh, 
Google sworn statement for and the first hit will be this army form and I showed it in the video and I said well if it's good enough for the army it's good enough for me I spent eight years in the army I use their form and I believe that the courts because they're not using a court seal and the clerks aren't uh, filing papers and all these other things that were not actually in court and that would be um, oh they stopped uh, habeas corpus I got a word for it. I can never remember what it is, but it's been suspended. Habeas corpus has been suspended. We're not in a court using a court seal. Or it hasn't been suspended, but they're keeping us from going there. Well, that gold fringe flag in a courtroom is a military flag. That's called the national color. It's not the flag of the Navy, it's the flag of the Army. And the Army has a duty to that flag and to the Constitution. And so if we're under martial law, which was declared in, um, by President Lincoln by order, and then later by the Congress in an uh, act of Congress uh, in 1863, according to the Labor Code, unless there's a proclamation or it's written into a peace treaty, it doesn't stop. So we're still under martial law. And that's covered in those other two videos. You just have to watch them. I don't, I don't have time to... And I'm not going to try to prove it to you. If you don't believe me, I don't care. Right? This is my theory. Uh, and so based on that theory, I'm going to try certain things. And the next one will be to file a complaint. But the fact that the IRS has admitted this is a response to your request, dated November 15, 2016, request for information from tax exempt status of County of Kent. We have no record of this organization having tax exempt status under Internal Revenue Code code 501A. Now how would I how would you know if it should? Well let's just try this. Okay. 26 USC 501. Man, I wish I could type. Okay, so here's section 501. So it says, according to uh, Internal Revenue Code 501, they don't have any record, 501A, right? So what's 501A say? It says, an organization described in C or D of this section, or section 401A, shall be exempt from taxation under the subtitle unless such exemption is denied under section 502 or 503. You go to C list of exempt organizations. The following organizations are referred to in subsection A. Okay, so now all we need to do is do a word search on P-O-L-I-T-I-C-A-L-S-U-B B-D-I-B-I-S That's enough. And if we go down to here, let's see, where are we? An organization is described in this subparagraph. It's such organization is right the United States, any state or political subdivision thereof, or any agency, instrumentality, or any of the foregoing. And this C here is part of 25 and if you filed all these up these are all the entities listed under lowercase c right here which means that they're under a and so if it's a political subdivision it should be exempt under a because it says taxation it didn't say federal income tax it just said taxation right that's a wide ranging term no record of this organization having tax exempt status under Internal Revenue Code Section 501A. Therefore, we are unable to provide any documents in response to your request. Therefore, there is no evidence that the County of Kent is a political subdivision. So why are they collecting taxes? Why are they doing all these things in the name of Kent County? 
who should be doing them, but that is the name on the form when you get it. You call Kent County, you get something from County of Kent. Sounds like an unlawful conversion to me. And, uh, hey, so that's what we're going to play with. And I haven't written up the complaint yet, but that's I just wanted to show that it's easy enough to get the letter. And uh, it isn't just for your county. This would be um, any entity that's claiming to be tax exempt. Any entity claiming to be tax exempt has to have a determination letter. And if you'd watched my videos before, I had tried putting complaints in against Planned Parenthood. Um, that didn't work for whatever reason. But I'm going to go try it this way now. I'm going to ask for theirs, see if they have a determination letter. If they don't, well, I'll do the same thing I'm going to do with the county. I'm going to send it to the Central Violation Bureau. And that's where we're headed next is to see what we could do with the Central Violation Bureau. Um, based on trying to help a few people. So give me just a second here. Okay. Um, so these are, uh, just so we don't forget, I don't forget to mention them, in the uh, revised statutes, section 5506 to 5532, are covered in a particular United States Code 42 U.S.C. something or other. We'll look at it in a second. And um, so this is out of here is what I'm going to use as the basis for the complaints that I'm writing for people that um, their loved ones have been incarcerated, right? Because that would be kidnapping or conspiracy to deprive any person of equal protection of laws, kidnapping, holding or returning a person to peonage receiving or carrying away any person to be sold or held as a slave on and on and on obstruction of execution of process of civil rights other crimes committed while in violation of the preceding sections conspiracy to injure or intimidate citizens in the exercise of their civil rights well we got all sorts of things here that we could say people are doing to us um, and I'll show you why that's important here in just a second so let's go look at uh, well, let's look what was going on. So a lady called me, whose son has been incarcerated in the state of Indiana, an arrest warrant for a felony. Um, state of Indiana, which we're going to see that's incorrect. It needs to say the state of Indiana. Versus, and then they had the gentleman in his uh, middle initial name, not his proper name, but with the middle initial the same here with the middle initial even though it has a place for an alias they said his name was with a middle initial well that isn't his name everybody has one full legal name mine's Robert Allen Ritluski but if I if it had been me they would have put Robert A Ritluski in those lines right they didn't want to put his social security number they didn't want to use a phone citation they don't really want to have any um, valid or lawful tie-in between the person they're going to pick up and the, the warrant. You're going to pick up some dude with a middle initial name, which is a pseudonym. It's not anybody's name, so it's a John Doe. And charge him with a bunch of stuff. But this is the important thing. Well, two. Witness the clerk and seal of said court on this, the 16th day of December 2000. 14. I do not see any seal of the court. No seal of the court means, hey, you're not in court. You're not in court, and they're pretending this court. That's a violation of your civil rights. Not only that, it's the suspension of habeas corpus, because they're not delivering the body to the court. They're just pretending to. So you are hereby commanded to arrest a dude with a middle initial, forthwith and hold that person to bail in the Orange Circuit Court of Orange County in the state of Indiana for the above offense. And for want of bail, commit him to jail of the county and here and after without unnecessary delay bring him before said court. But there's no court seal. Right? So so what I had asked her for is well send me something um 
because you know I didn't have any paperwork at the time. I said, well, do you have the sentencing order, something like that, where there's an order where you know if the judge did it, well, show me the the court seal. This was one of the pieces of paper she sent because it's so blatant. Witness the clerk and seal of said court. So if you have a loved one at work or in court in jail, go look at the arrest warrant. Go look for the paperwork first of all, and see if it has a court seal. If it doesn't, well then, there's your evidence. And now, what do we do with it? So this is one piece of paper. And she also sent me the order. State of Indiana, County of Orange, right? Not Orange County, County of Orange, in the Orange Circuit Court, right? There is no court named in the anywhere. So they're saying this is actually taking place somewhere else, but you ain't there because it's in the Orange Circuit Court, but this isn't it. I don't even think Orange Circuit Court's the right name. It should be Orange County Circuit Court. I'm thinking, but State of Indiana, we'll see that that's incorrect. Versus, uh, do with a middle initial. The State of Indiana appears by somebody acting as a prosecuting attorney and the defendant, some do with a middle initial in person and by counsel, some dude without a middle name and another dude with a middle name, for a sentencing hearing. Now, if you had gone and looked all these names up on the state's bar website, you would see that, you know, they're not using the names that they have their license, that they were licensed in. The defendant informs the court. So this is this was the sentencing order. The defendant informs the court that he needs the appointment of a guardian at Leadham. The court advises the defendant that he has no need for an appointment of guardian ad litem because the court has previously appointed a law firm to represent the defendant at trial. The court inquires of the defendant if he's reviewed the pre-sentence investigation report. He has not. The court allows the defendant and counsel time to review the report. Well, how come the man's only getting to see it when he's sitting in court? Pre-sentence investigation report. Never had a chance to look at it. And now, while you're sitting in court, well, go ahead, take your time. Tick, 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 tick. All right? Well, that ain't very good. The court again inquires the defendant if he has corrections or amendments that need to be made to the report, and the defendant fails to answer or does not respond. State of Indiana advises they have no corrections or amendments. The court notes that there may be clerical errors that can be amended. Oh, like it hasn't been filed in the court? Doesn't have a seal on it? You know, that's, that would be another thing. Um, this document doesn't have, wasn't filed in the court. There's no clerk seal on it. Or clerk file stamp, excuse me. Nor was there a clerk file stamp on the, on the warrant. Right? These were never put into the court case. There's no file stamp. Right? Received, entered. It doesn't say who received it, who entered it. Where is the file stamp from the clerk's office? They don't have them. The court again requires, uh, if he had direction, uh, okay, the defendant now requests an interlocutory appeal. The court denies said request and advises the defendant the court cannot grant an interlocutory appeal after conclusion of the jury trial, which is technically true because interlocutory is like a provisional prior to. See, this is after they've already determined the trial's over. This is sentencing. Interlocutory would be before the trial's over. The defendant pro se states his rights to due process have been violated. He is correct. He goes on to state he was denied adequate counsel at trial and his attorneys failed to follow his instructions and have this case and these charges dismissed. The defendant pro se requests the court dismiss all charges. The defendant is advised by the court that the court will not dismiss the charges after finding a guilty in a jury trial. The court notes the defendant's attorney represented his interest in a competent and professional manner and that he was acquitted of two of the charges. The state of Indiana admits State's Exhibit 1, counsel to the defendant has no objection. The court now admits State's Exhibit 1 and makes it part of the record. Exhibit 1 is a criminal history of the defendant. The defendant once again demands a hearing to be stayed so he can file an interlocutory appeal. The court again denies request for stay of sentencing. The court advises the defendant his right for interlocutory appeal has passed. It had. The court once again advises the defendant 
that these proceedings may not be recorded, videotaped, or otherwise transcribed by anyone other than the court. The court instructed the security officer to remove any recording device. Counsel for the defendant advised the defendant on record that he has a right to make a statement prior to sentencing and inquires if the defendant wishes to do so. The defendant again demands that this matter be appealed prior to sentencing. Defendant claims it's a violation of his right to due process for the court to proceed with sentencing without granting an interlocutory appeal. The court again denies demand for an interlocutory appeal because it's too late. The state of Indiana represents arguments to the court as to sentencing or presents arguments to the court. The counsel for the defendant presents an argument. Don't know what they said. For its sentencing statement, the court says that there are grieved circumstances to be considered. Criminal history, defendant's total disdain for law enforcement, disrespect the court, blah, 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 five years, one year, one year, one year. Defendant further ordered to pay fine of one dollar plus cost of 183 bond terminated and sureties released the court now advises the defendant he has a right to appeal the conviction and sentence imposed in the case the order to appeal must file you must file either a notice or appeal or a motion to correct error within 30 days if you elect to file a motion to correct error you must file your notice of appeal within 30 days after the adverse ruling on the motion. Fairly comply with this, blah, 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 including an appeal, blah, blah. Okay, that's enough. Anyways, I haven't read this over and over. What we, I'm going to tell this lady because we've, we've already written something and put it into the CVB. But this motion to correct error is what needed to be done to say, hey, there's no seal on the warrant. The warrant wasn't put into the court. Whatever it is that hasn't been done, motion to correct error. It would have been one way to do it. Right? And so that's, you know, that's what, uh, and they put a guy in jail for that kind of stuff. Now, this is what we did, though. Instead, um, and so she put her proper name and her address, and we called it an information and complaint. Crimes against elective franchise and civil rights of citizens. Um, well, that's because that's what they call that right here. And so take judicial notice. And anyways, so we sent it to the United States District Court, care of Ted Willman, CVB Branch Chief, Central Violation Bureau, P.O. Box 780549, San Antonio, Texas, 78278, fax number 210-301-6401. Um, sent it by fax and instead of using the sworn statement because we're, you know, I just wanted to get it in quick to see if they'd do something we can always go back and we'll do whatever they want once they pay attention to us we're doing this as an unsworn statement which is allowed under uh, title 28 if you put uh, penalty of perjury statement at the end so um so instead of going through the sworn statement, which we still might, because I wanted to get it done quick to get it in, we did it this way, and we'll just see what happens. Because it just got in on Friday, right? So, um, Title 42, U.S. Code, 1987, prosecution of violation of certain laws. The United States attorneys, marshals, deputy marshals, United States magistrate judges appointed by the district and territorial courts with power to arrest, imprison, or bail offenders and every other officer who is especially empowered by the president are authorized and required at the expense of the United States to institute prosecutions against all persons violating any of the provisions of section 1990 of this or those sections of the any of these if they're violating any of these any of these then um The United States attorneys, marshals, deputy marshals, United States magistrate judges appointed by district territorial courts with power to arrest, imprison, or bail offenders, and every other officer who is especially empowered by the president are authorized and required at the expense of the United States to institute prosecution. Well, 
conspiracy to deprive any person of equal protection of laws. I would say that's one. No court seal. Uh, where does it talk about state law? Where is that thing? Conspiracy to injure or intimidate citizens and exercise civil rights. There would be one. Other crimes committed while doing that. There would be something. Depriving citizens of civil rights under color of state laws. Because these people in this thing called state of Indiana are pretending to be the state of Indiana in a criminal matter and they don't have any jurisdiction. We'll continue on. Indiana Constitution, Article 7, Section 18 states, All criminal prosecutions shall be carried on in the name and by the authority of the state, and the style of all process shall be the state of Indiana. If that ain't the plaintiff, you ain't in the state of Indiana's court. State of Indiana, not the state of Indiana. Right? You're not in their court. Okay, and so uh, this is a mother filling this out because her son's in jail and he can't do this, right? So I, the name of the mother, full legal name, citizen of the United States, whether you, if you don't like to be a citizen of the United States, then take it out. I don't care. File this information and complaint on behalf of the United States of America, XREL, the full legal name of your son, Robert Allen Ritluski. Not Robert A., not Rutluski, Robert Allen. No, Robert Allen Rutluski in proper case with the United States District Court to provide probable cause for federal law enforcement to investigate and prosecute violations of various revised statutes referenced in 42 U.S.C. Code 1987 as well as the Indiana Constitution by officers of the Orange Circuit Court, County of Orange, State of Indiana. We'll make it about the officers of the court that they're committing the crime because they're violating the sections of this 1987 which are all these right here so let's give them probable cause it is I belief uh, it is my belief that ca case or cause number is a simulated legal process by color of state law hey we just read about that I include the sentencing order issued using the fictitious name, middle initial name, of the judge of a private tribunal calling itself Orange Circuit Court to establish probable cause. It is my belief that this sentencing order of middle initial name, right, that's the judge using the middle initial name, that's not his name either, it's not the name that he took an oath, or that uh, he became an attorney under, and you need to be an attorney at law licensed to practice in the state of uh, Indiana to be a judge. So the middle initial name isn't the name that is attached to any authority whatsoever. It's my belief that the sentencing order of Mr. Middle Initial and co-conspirators has resulted in the kidnapping and torture of son who is now held against his will by the Indiana Department of Corrections. This sentencing order was not filed by the court clerk. Was it? No. There's no file stamp on it. This sentencing order has no court seal of court record. No, it doesn't. The sentencing order is not the style of process mandated by Article or Section 18 of Article 7 of the Indiana Constitution for criminal prosecutions. In the, or the for them, it's the state of Indiana. In Michigan, it's in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. Every state has a different style. Right? So this was out of the Constitution. So go to the section of your Constitution that has to do with the judiciary and see if it talks about, you know, criminal process. The sentencing order uses pseudonyms to conceal true identity of the individuals claiming to be officers of the court, prosecuting attorney, counsel, and judge. They're all using middle initial names or not using their middle name at all, just first name, last name. The sentencing order uses the pseudonym middle initial name for the son instead of the son's full legal name. The sentencing order is not a legal process of the state of Indiana. No, it's state of Indiana. It's my belief that the Orange Circuit 
court is not a court of general jurisdiction of the state of Indiana and its officers have no authority to enforce any of the said state's laws or prosecute its criminal matters. It's my belief that the person of her son has been concealed from the court of competent jurisdiction and instead subjected to crimes against the elective franchise and civil rights of citizens. In other words, it didn't take into court where there's a seal. They're pretending he's in court. That's a violation of his elective franchise and civil rights of citizens. So Ted Willman, CVB branch chief or other competent authority, I ask you to rescue, full legal name, son, from this lawless band of terrorists and see to his complete remedy and equity for the injustice he has endured. I declare, certify, state under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Executed on. Uh, we did this on Thursday, right? And so, that's when I wrote it, but she didn't get it sent out till Friday. And so I don't know if anything's happened yet. I, I doubt it. But, you know, if she wants to, she can call Monday and find out what they're going to do with it. The key was to get it in. And so it's been done. Thank you, Jesus. Right? We'll see we'll see if that brings us to anything. But um uh, Okay, so hang on just a second. I gotta reload some papers. Uh I just wanted to show that courts of records do have seals, at least in Michigan because the following courts are courts of record and possess seals. The Supreme Court, the Circuit Courts, the Probate Court, the Recorder's Court of Detroit, Court of Claims, and other courts that, that the legislator designates a courts of record. They, have court, they all have a seal. So where's the seal? We're not talking about the clerk. We're talking about the court. Courts need to have a seal. They're going to be a court of record. And also in Michigan, right, the style of process. Now, here, we've got these three different sections of law that say uh, all writs and process issuing out of the Supreme Court shall be styled in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. All writs and process issuing out of the courts of appeal, appeals, shall be in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. But name isn't capitalized, people isn't capitalized, state isn't capitalized. The style of process of courts of record shall be in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. Name, people, state, they're all capitalized, right? This court of appeals, for some reason, they didn't capitalize the N on name, the P on people, or the S on state. But they did, the Supreme Court, and uh, courts of record, they're both using the same style, where the name is capitalized, capital N, P for people's capitalized, S for state is capitalized. So I'm not sure what this court of appeals is. It's like it's a different court. And this could be the, you know, two jurisdictions running at the same time or something. I, I really don't know. I just pointed it out. Um, so, with all that said, now that was for somebody whose child was in court and sent it to the CVB, but what else can we use it for? Well, Bobby in Arizona, we're going to probably be trying this, right? Where it would be full legal name and address, notice and demand. What he's going to do first is send it to the lender on his deed of trust, right? So this is to do with a deed of trust where they didn't lend you any money, nobody signed the deed of trust but you. So it cannot be a bilateral business contract. It could only be a unilateral contract of donation and if you didn't plan on donating your property then you need to speak up. Right here, lender is a corporation organized and existing under the laws of Delaware, Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation. Lender's mailing address is uh, something or other, right? Jacksonville, Michigan. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that's their business address, but it's their mailing address. And so when I wrote this up, we used the, the 
business or excuse me the mailing address but what you might want to do in fact we'll go look right now because every state will have this All right if you go to your state to wherever your corporation commission is or secretary of state whoever's the one that authorizes businesses to do business in your state and you put in uh, Not down there, down here. So I put in Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation. And first I did a search on active. Right? And there is no Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation active. But if you go in here and you make it inactive, well, sure enough, there is a Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation. And you click on it, and it says that it merged with other corporations on 4 24 2012. Okay, so, um, but what it showed was that it has a statutory agent information, and so if you want to contact the business you need to contact their statutory agent and here on the deed of trust they have you sending it to a mailing address right they don't give the statutory agents address they give a mailing address down in Florida where of course this is a entity in uh, Arizona all that to say we may be changing the address from the mailing address to the statutory agent's address. I'm sure we will. We may send them both one. Why? Well, because <laughs> you can. It's just a stamp and an envelope. But the idea is to tell them this, that Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation, a Delaware corporation using mailing address whatever, is a lender upon a deed of trust for which I am the borrower. And this is Bob in Arizona. And sure enough, there's Robert Bradford Kirby. He's the borrower. Here's the lender, Maryland's Credit Corporation. It's easy when you don't have to tell no lies, he's tell the truth. Uh, the MIN number is a mortgage identification number incorporated by reference to the said deed of trust. I have included the first page of the deed of trust for your reference. Why would I do that? Well, to show that <laughs> I'm the borrower and you're the lender. And it's come to the borrower's attention that Merrill Lynch Credit Corporation, that would be the lender, does not have a license to do business in Arizona, did not sign the deed of trust, did not loan the borrower anything of substance, has converted borrower's mortgage note to a negotiable instrument, has collected periodic payments for a loan it never made, has used the instrumentalities of interstate commerce and the mails as part of its process to invest my private property for personal gains. Therefore, I, whatever your name is, borrower, demand the immediate return of my rights, titles, and interests to all securities, investments, and accounts, and the like, established and maintained as a product of said deed of trust and mortgage note that are mine by right and equity. Or I will be forced to file a complaint with the United States District Court, care of the Central Violation Bureau of the United States Courts, for your involvement in the embezzlement and theft of my private property. I await your reply. And so before going to the you know, to the court to file a complaint, let's just put it on the table, say hey, this, 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 and see what they answer back with. If they don't rebut your answers, well then all the more reason to take them to the uh, Central Violation Bureau. Now the reason for the Central Violation Bureau again is on the sworn statement form that comes from the military. At the top of the form it lists a military regulation that it falls under and in that regulation it talks about the Central Violation Bureau and the federal traffic ticket basically, but it says that's only one way for them to send something to the Central Violation Bureau. Another way is on a complaint. And so, um, uh, 
and so after I had done that video, Rosita sent a FOIA request to the CVB and said, you know, according to this Army regulation, I can send you a complaint. What's the procedure to send you a complaint? And they said, send it to Ted, or whatever the guy's name was. And that's what, you know, so that's what we're doing. And um, we'll see what happens. But, you know, this, this here is just an idea of something to send to the person who says they're the lender on your deed of trust because this lender didn't ever have a license to do business in your state. They may have papers in, but they're not going to be proper. Now, in, in Bob's case, Merrill Lynch Credit, Credit Corporation does have some paper, but in other ones we've looked, and there's no listing ever of that corporation that's listed as the lender as having been authorized to do business in your state. Right? This, the lender is organized and existing under the laws of Delaware, which means it needs to have... Um, a certificate of uh, authority or similar from your Secretary of State for it to do business in your state. Then, if it's banking, it may have to have another license to be a banker or lender. Right? They have to have that paperwork. And so even if you say, well, I'm not really sure if they got that or not, some things that are indisputable is they didn't sign the deed of trust. So did not loan the borrower anything of substance. They can't lend you anything unless they sign the deed of trust. You don't have an agreement. Has converted borrower's mortgage note to a negotiable instrument, which happened, right? Uh, has th That's what securitization is. It's converting your mortgage note into something else, into a negotiable instrument. They have been collecting periodic payments. And they did use the instrumentalities of interstate commerce and the mails as part of its process to invest my private property for personal gains or to embezzle my private property or whatever it ends up being. But that just put it under the commerce clause, clause of the Constitution. That's why that was in there. So, anyways, that's what's been going on this last week. And uh, hopefully this week we can dot some I's and cross some T's and Get somebody to actually do something. That'd be great. Um, and it's a good thing I'm done because now the phone's going to start ringing. Y'all have a great day. We'll see ya.